but for those who don't know me, my name is Aladis van Bielforde, and I am residing in Gutvik, the fairest and most shiniest of baronies in west of Sweden. Today I'm going to talk about same-sex sexuality in the Middle Ages. Usually I refer to this class as a sin against nature, and there is a very good reason for that, because the concept of sex, sexuality, and all these things were so different in the Middle Ages that our modern concepts don't really make any sense. This class is not entirely new. I've been doing it for several years, which means that it's not on the cutting edge of research. It is based on other people's scholarly work because my own scholarly work deals with material culture and clothing in the early modern period. But I will give some re references that you can check out if you want to. And there's a lot of things happening in this field right now. I have colleagues who've been working with how ac accusations of same sex sexuality was used as a political tool in the Middle Ages, for example. So there's a lot of things happening there. So I'm a little bit behind the newest research, but I think it's you know good enough anyway. What we today would call homosexuality was both condemned and hushed down in the Middle Ages, especially regarding women, of course, because you know women are always less important. Uh, but regardless of the opinion of church and state, people just like today fell in love with and had sexual relationships with persons of the same sex as themselves. This lecture is about medieval views of homosexuality, its causes and consequences, and about love and how it was expressed in the Middle Ages. The concepts homosexuality and heterosexuality are both coined during the second half of the 19th century. Central to those concepts is identity that which sex a person prefers to have emotional or sexual relations with or are attracted to sort of defines him or her. This is not the historical way, I mean, older historical way of thinking about these things. Foucault, who is of course the single most influential thinker on the history of sexuality in the 20th and 21st century, says that prior to when homosexuality became seen as a disease in the 19th century. Individuals were not defined as homosexuals, only actions. And this means that, means that a person could be a sodomite or a fricatrice, which is the lovely word sometimes used for women, but not a homosexual. Likewise, the concept of heterosexuality was new and shows new ways of thinking about sex and your well, relationships. For course, ideas have well, it has revolutionized the study of sexuality in the, in the pre-modern era, but they have not been left uncriticized. Above all, they have been nuanced. An important question here has been when and how a homosexual identity was created. It has been made clear that it actually happened before the 19th century. Most people point towards the end of the 16th century and the beginning of the 17th century as a crucial time period for this formation of homosexual identity. And then we are mainly or almost exclusively talking about a male homosexual identity, which isn't so strange because, you know, society was for men, all history, most of the history that is written is for men. Uh, but also actually because men's homosexual acts or same-sex sexual acts were condemned harder than women's in periods, so we have much more sources for that. Uh, the first known English word for a man belonging to a sexual subculture, which included homosexual acts, occurs by the end of the 16th century, and that word is molly. It comes from the Latin word mollus, which means soft, and it was actually used in regard to men's sexual relationships already in the Roman era. The thing is, and I will get back to that, is the problem that the Romans had with this, and also actually the early Middle Ages, is the softness. It's the passivity, it's the breaking away from the no gender norm for men, not actually, you know, the sex part of it all. But I will get back to that. Uh, because the word molly cannot actually be equalized to a gay man of our days. A central part of the molly culture of the 18th century was to dress up in women's clothing and adopt a woman's name, and that is not generally a part of the gay uh, society today. 
And this was always, was often done by bo both by the person who would be considered active and the passive partner in a relationship. Because in those days, a relationship between, between two men was always conceived as having one active and one passive partner. You know, you've seen it or even today when people ask, who's the man and the woman in your relationship? Uh, well, usually, you know, if it's two men, it's usually two men in the relationship. I've, but people ask these kind of questions and they have very long history, considering that it should only be one active or one passive partner in this. So the Molly subculture figured, uh, featured cross-dressing and assuming a female gender role, which was an important part of that. And you don't really see that a lot in modern gay men's culture, with, of course, the exception of the drag queens. But it also shows this sort of taking a woman's name and, and uh, dressing up in women's clothes shows that social roles, gender, was in many ways more important than biological sex in the early modern and medieval perception of gender. But, as I said, homosexuality, homosexual people, like women and children, has for a long time been invisible when history is written. We historians have a tendency to only concern ourselves with the big events and evolutions in politics and economics the war, the industrial revolution, and things like that. And of course, as I said in the beginning, even more invisible than gay men are lesbians, because they are excluded both for being women and for being homosexual. And of course, this is actually true today too. Gay men has much higher status in society and are more visible in media than lesbian women. I mean, they might be gay, but they're still men after all. Uh, men were and are, however, more exposed to violence because of their homosexuality, since they pose a more obvious threat to masculinity. Those so-called corrective rape occurs both in history and today. A lesbian woman can, of course, also be seen as a threat to masculinity, but in another way. But that you won't find gay people in general history books doesn't mean that there is no historical research concerning the subject of same-sex sex relationships. Homosexuality and all kinds of sexuality has become a much more popular field of research in the 1990s and in the 21st century. And that's what I said in the beginning. There's so many things happening now that it's really hard to keep up. There are also more sources than one would usually think. There is more about men, as I said, than about women. And there's more from the antiquity and from the period of the 1700s than from the periods between, which is of course the period we in the SA are recreating and trying to, to uh, examine and study. Sources from same-sex sexuality from the Middle Ages are of varying kind, as in so many other cases for this period. Among the most valuable sources are court protocols and other legal documents, because for many, many, many centuries, this was also seen as a crime penitentiaries and similar. That is religious documents telling the priest what kind of penance you should do if you've done a specific sin. And those are really, really interesting. There are also quite a few of them that people now believe are written as more, more like porn for priests rather than descriptions of actual things happening. Uh, advisory literature for convents, if we're into the field of what's happening in the religious sphere. Because, of course, they were aware of the dangers from their point of view of gathering a lot of people of the same gender in, in their communes, in the, in the convents. You find other types of religious manuscripts. Medical literature is interesting because they were sometimes looking for a medical explanation for this. And secular fiction. So those are the sources that we have a look at and what we can work with as historians. I'm going to, now going to go back in time a little bit because the ancient heritage is an important part of this field. Uh, because both Greece and Rome were great cultural influences for medieval society and from both these cultures but especially from Greece there are many 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 more sources concerning homosexuality than it is from the Middle Ages. During the pre-Christian era 
uh, homosexual acts between men were tolerated and in Greece even exalted. Ancient Greece homosexuality uh, was, on the other hand, not so, some kind of free love. It was strictly regulated with a clear hierarchy, older men and younger boys, sometimes pre-pubertal, so this is really icky, and of course would be very, very condemned today. But there were also gay relationships between soldiers because it was supposed to strengthen the bond between brothers in arms. The Greeks strongly emphasized self-control and temperance, both in gay and straight sexual relationships. And there was much scorn for those who were seen as obsessed or weak because of their love or their lust. And that actually was the same with heterosexual relationships. In Rome, we don't find the same open tolerance for male homosexuality. That is because the Roman society was totally obsessed with the family. You know, the man, the wife, the concubines, and all the kids that should come from that. But it was not condemned either, as long as the family duties were fulfilled. So it was perfectly all right to sleep around with people of the same sex, as long as you got your, you know, free born uh, children born within the marriage. And both male and female slaves were, of course, sexually available for the master. This is not, I mean, this is not a pretty history, but this is the way it was. Just like in ancient Greek, in Rome, a man's ability for self-control was emphasized. And what was condemned was a man who was not in control of his sexuality. So here you see a theme. There's a lot of things about control, about not being soft, not being obsessed, about you know, being manly, having the manly virtues. And as I said before, in ancient times, it appears that male homosexuality was often what we would call pederasty, adult men having sexual intercourse with younger, sometimes prepubescent boys. This is, of course, in contrast to modern male homosexuality, which usually is androphilic, that is the love of men for men. Um, the fact that they had this sort of unequal relationship when it came to age is in line with the hierarchical, hierarchical, this is a very hard word to say in English, hierarchical constitution of all forms of sexuality in this period. An interesting thing is when you get to the Middle Ages, they start using the medieval, te the, the ancient text and reinterpreting them. And you find that in all kinds of fields, religion, literature, everything. And they're actually doing this with the ancient text that deals with homosexual themes too. But they were censored or reinterpreted, often in rather far-fetched ways, like somebody's describing the lust between two men and it ends up being saying, oh, no, no, it is the man's love for God or something like that. They always thought of reinterpreting things that were pretty obvious to the person who wrote them. It was about gay love. Uh, but and because of this, enough of it was still around for educated people to actually, you know, get hold of it and understand about it. But that was men. Women are almost totally invisible in the ancient sources and we have very very little about women's homosexual homosexual feelings and acts an older term used is sapphic love which of course refers back to the famous poet from the sixth century before common era whose poetry is said to be about women's sexual desire for each other but we actually don't know if that's what they are about. Many of them were in fact written as, written as wedding songs or wedding poetry, because in those days, poets were writing for pay, not for you know, expressing their own feelings. But later, much of Sappho's poetry was interpreted thus, and this gave us the, name, the term sapphic love, which is found at least in the early modern period, and the word lesbian, which comes from the island she lived on, Lesbos, where they apparently have some rather nice summer retreats these days, according to my colleagues. But that was the ancient time. Now I'm going to get into the Middle Ages, which is, after all, the focus of this lecture. That homosexuality, or rather all sexu sexuality, was seen as act rather than identity, makes definitions different from today. It also becomes much more important who is doing what? 
This also leads that men's and women's homosexual acts were in most cases seen as separate things with little or no connection. I want to start with the men because we have more sources for them. And if you look at the early Middle Ages, now we're talking not Scandinavian early Middle Ages, which would be from year 1000 and onwards, but you know, the 6th and 7th and 8th century up until the high Middle Ages, up to the 12th century. Uh, the ideas about homosexual acts appear to be similar to those in the Roman times. Pederasty was probably still more common than androphilia. Sexuality in the Middle Ages was a great deal about hierarchy and with the difference in age, there was a natural hierarchy. And this was often enhanced by also by an unequal social position. From exa for, for example, uh, some early medieval literature implies that it was normal for knights to have sex with their pages while on campaign. The ideas about hierarchy and also the ideas about one active and one passive partner in a sexual act made it very hard for medieval thinkers to conceive of a man who would be both the penetrator and the penetrated in anal intercourse. This was not something they could think about. And this is actually something that goes on for a very long time, having those ideas. In the early Middle Ages, male homosexual acts were generally not seen as a problem for society as long as men got married and produced heirs. It was not an issue for the secular society, just like it was in the Roman times. But it was, of course, a moral and a religious problem, and I will get back to that. What scholars have seen is that during the 12th century, you begin to see a change in this, and the sodomite is beginning to be seen as a serious problem. Here, the main source that people have been using are secular romances, because they start having different kinds of problems that I didn't have before in them. Uh, one mo most known one is a version of the Roman de Aeneas, that is a medieval telling of the Aeneid, uh, this Roman story, where one knight is, uh, well, he is having a relationship with his brother in arms. And in an older story, this would probably have been rather unproblematic. But in the Roman de Aeneas, that is the oldest example we have when they see this, uh, this obsession that he has with his brother in arms is hindering him from having a happy marriage with his wife. So they're go going to sort of problematizing this relationship now. And some scholars are of the idea that this change is linked to the emerging state power because close relationships between aristocratic men were now being seen as a poten potential threat. In the feudal state, the ties of loyalty should be, to be between the king and the noblemen, not between men on the same level, which could pose a threat to the king's power. Instead, a loving relationship between a man and a woman was emphasized in medieval literature from this time. This is interesting because the general idea that feudal society should only have vertical connections is actually a little bit outdated these days. Most modern research and scholarships on the feudal society emphasize also the horizontal lines. So mm, it might not be this change in society that makes it more difficult to express gay love. We don't really know that, but it could happen. And even if, of course, a loving relationship between a man and a woman becomes more important and more emphasized in courtly literature in the 12th and 13th century, the homosocial bonds, the bonds between men was of course still more important than any kind of relationship that you could have with a woman for a man. Actually, marriage can be seen as one way of, for men to create bonds between them. And the woman is just, you know, the means in this. I'm going to talk about the Nordic countries a little bit because, you know, living in the Nordic countries, and it appears that the attitude here was much the same as in the rest of Europe in the early Middle Ages. Uh, that is, a sex, sexually active man could have sex with both men and women without much condemnation, but, and that is seen quite a lot in Nordic sources. The passive partner in a male homosexual relationship lost both honor and reputation. And there we have specific words for this. Words like arger and ergi implies a man who's been anally penetrated, which means that he's like a woman. The same as you could see if you use the word mollus in the Roman context. 
that means that you are not a real man. Another word used in this time is serdad, which is a verb, and it means somebody has taken you. That is also all these things uh, accusing someone to be ergi or serdad were the kind of insults that you had to pay a fine if you if you used them, because it, which shows that this was really something horrible to say to someone. It was punishable by law. But also, you in the Nordic countries find a general view this negative view of men who are not able to control their sexuality, also to men who become too interested in having sex with women. They become soft, soft and unmanly from this close relationship. And as I said, homosociality is still the most important thing, much more important than heterosexuality. Um, parenthetical, I can mention that in continental church criticism from the 12th century, you find accusations of men who, due to their heterosexual interest in women, start wearing soft, fine clothes, write poetry, care for their personal hygiene, etc. And they become effeminatus, effeminate. Uh, but that is not an accusation of homosexuality. That is an ex accusation of a too strong heterosexual interest which disturbs his homosociality. So that's when you talk about the Middle Ages, modern concept just doesn't work because they are totally obsessed with men should only be social with men but yeah it's also a good thing if they have sex with women because then you get children as far as i know we have no nordic medieval sources to women's homosexual acts and i'm very sorry for that love between women is mentioned in literature i will come back to this but since friendship both for men and women was ex expressed in much more emotional way than today it is impossible to say if that love was also erotic and that you see actually in europe too and is a problem that we will have to address in some way work around it uh, constantly when dealing with women's desire and love for each other there was much less knowledge of sex between women in the middle ages some that said that it just couldn't exist not because they, like the English Queen Victoria, was said to believe that women didn't have erotic desires. Women don't do these things. Uh, but because it was very hard for, the, for them to imagine sex without a man. Sex was in the Middle Ages seen and described as something that someone, it is a man, was doing to someone else. Either a woman or a mollus, uh, another man who's taking the soft road. But the role of woman was passive and receiving, which means that they had very hard time thinking about women having sex with each other. But unlike in Victorian days, women were generally perceived as more lustful than men. They just couldn't figure out how you would do it if you didn't have a man. People don't have enough imagination. Although even Saint Paul, and now we're talking, you know, the early Christian society, he mentions women doing what he calls unnatural acts with other women, as if they were a man and a woman. And Paul was, of course, read during the Middle Ages, even if Sappho probably wasn't. And there were terms for women, for lesbians, terms which, like sodomite, stress the act and not the identity. And one of them is the one I mentioned in the beginning, the fricatrice, or some similar word, which comes from a Latin word meaning to rub. So then you know what you do together. But for something to be real sex, it had to be penetration, however. And that is what's occupying the minds of legislators and of clerics. And there are much fewer women in court records regarding homosexual acts. But in those cases, we have it. It's seen, it is seen as an aggravating circumstance if they use the dildo because then you, you know, assert the role of the man in the society. But there was also a theory that some women had an exceptionally large clitoris, which they used as a penis. And on occasion, this was actually examined in court cases. I don't know if they ever found one of these. Um, one location where we know from later times, such as the 17th century, where it's a well documented, uh, we know that lesbian women confined each other, was of course the nunneries, 
To be a nun was, apart from a religious calling, also a way to avoid marriage to a man and to find female community. The question is, of course, how much physical love there was between women in the nunneries, but one was aware of the risks. Just as for men, there are evidence of this if you look at the order regulations. Saint Augustine, yeah, none other than the church father, Saint Augustine, he actually warned his sister against liking one nun above the others. <coughs> Sorry. And if you look at the rules for the Augustine nuns, the nuns should sleep in large halls and they should sleep in their own beds. And this is something that's unusual for most social classes of this period. Most people actually shared beds with other people. Uh, so they should sleep, sleep in large halls. So, you know, they didn't have any privacy and they should sleep in their own beds. And the older nuns should also keep an eye on the novices and the younger <laughs> nuns to see that there were no sexual acts taking place. So you actually have these sources already from the early Middle Ages about this. One of the most open relations about female erotic desire in the Middle Ages is probably those of the Dutch nun Hardewijk, who lived in the first half of the 13th century. From her pen is preserved 14 visions, 31 letters to other nuns and 16 poems. In her writings, the love and desire um, is of course sometimes directed at Christ. There is lots of really, really, really weird erotic poetry directed towards Christ, both in the writings of nuns and the writings of monks from the Middle Ages. But anyway, most, some of them are directed at Christ, which would see, be seen as sort of at least on the, in some, in some ways, heterosexual. But most of them are directed against what she called Frau Minne, and Minne, of course, is a German word that means courtly love or idealized love. So she's actually writing to this lady love. Um, and for Hardewijk, it, this Frau Minne represents the perfect love in female form. So sometimes she di directs her words to Frau Minne, and, but sometimes she herself is Frau Minne. It is hard to know, of course, if Hardewijk's letters and visions means that she also had sexual relations with other women, but at least they show that her love was directed at women, which today would be, she would be considered a lesbian. A later source from the 17th century from Italy, and that is from a book that is called Immodest Acts, the story of a lesbian nun, which I got as a birthday present when I was 25. Uh, anyway, this latest source from the 17th century shows an erotic relationship between an older nun who is also a leader in the community and a younger one. This in combination with the letters between Hardewijk and other nuns where the loved one is called little sister makes one ask the question where, whether there was the same hierarchy of age in lesbian relationships as they were in gay men's relationships at these times. Unfortunately, we have too few and too vague sources to make any conclusions on this, but it's interesting in a way to look at it. So we have some sources, we have legal sources, we have visions and poetry, and we have the, the, the rules for the nuns and the monks. But there's of course also, well, literature. I'll go back to literature now. Because even if it's not written out as such, you can still find it in literature. Because since it was the acts and not the individuals which were defined as homosexual, you could condemn the act but still be interested in the person committing the act. So we can find in literature descriptions of emotions and relationships that we, with our preconceptions, would interpret as homosexual. But where this may not actually have been the case, we don't really know that. Emotionality and love between men is often found. And this is seen in the literature or shown in the literature as a sign of how close friends they are and not necessarily that they also have a sexual relationship. For example, there's one knight who expresses um, his feeling and his wish to be the lady love of Gavin because of Gavin's prowess in tournaments. And this could, of course, be seen as he was in love with Gavin, but it can also be seen as hero worship, 
and friendship in this. But this is sometimes interesting because I, I sometimes lecture about beauty and gender in the Middle Ages that is not seen as um, not seen as something that is dependent on, on gender beauty. Beauty is seen as an absolute. And this is the same actually with love. Love is in medieval literature, literature seen as an absolute, irrespective of the loved one's gender. If you look at a 12th century French romance called Floris et Lyriope, and now I'm saying this very badly in Swedish, uh, the brother and sister Floris and Flori. They are twins, of course, otherwise you wouldn't call one Floris and one Flori. Uh, they are so alike that Flori, Floris, who is the, the boy, he can, without trouble, dress up and impersonate his sister as a way to get in close to his desired Luriope and win her love. So Floris dresses up as his sister Flori and says, I'm Flori, and he wants to make Luriope love him or her since he's actually Flori, or pretending to be Flori. And this works. Liriope becomes totally in love with Flori. And um, surprisingly for the modern reader, this is not a problem, because this is actually the solution. Because then, you know, Floris can just take off his women's clothing and say, ta-da, I am a man and we can get married. And this does not change the love. This is the solution to the problem because love is an absolute. It is not defined by gender. Love is love. So they just live happily ever after. This will happen. Uh, another example of how this beauty and love thing can be, be a little bit gliding or different than modern conception is from Fleur et Blanche Fleur, which of course is one of the most well-known medieval stories. Uh, Floire is the heroine who has been sold into captivity and she is in the harem of the king of Babylon. And there's some really, really fun stuff in that one, but I'm not going to get into that. Uh, Floire has a female friend that she loves. And here you can see there's a guardsman observing her, Clarice as she's called, and Floire uh, are sleeping together in the same bed holding each other and the guardsman he remarks that he never seen such sweet love as it is between those two and there is no condemnation there is no problem with this this is just a fact he's never seen such sweet love of course in this case it actually isn't Clarice that's in the bed with Fleur uh, with Fleur with with the Blanche Fleur sorry Blanche Fleur is the woman uh, it's actually Fleur her boyfriend but since you can't see the difference between a beautiful man and a beautiful woman, people think it's the other woman. In these two examples, Floris et Liriope and uh, Flore et Blanche Fleur, it's hard to say if there also was sex in the relationship with the women, between the women, or if it's only the kind of loving friendship that you find so often in 19th century novels and which fits so well with the Victorian idea of the asexual woman. But it wouldn't really work in the Middle Ages because the Middle Ages, then they saw women as creatures full of lust. So it seems very unlikely that two women sleeping together shouldn't you know, be overcome by all this lust that pours out of them. And there's actually, there are actually a few descriptions of sex between women found also in medieval literature. There's a Catalan 15th century romance called Tiran le Blanche, which is very, very amusing and different. And there you can actually see sexual acts described either as a preparation and a foreplay for seduction by a man or as a kind of amusement. I will give you two examples. Tirant is the hero, of course. Carmesina is the princess that he loves. And Heart's Joy is one of the ladies in waiting. And there you can also see this is sort of, they are moving into the field of uh, allegory because a lot of people have this Heart's Joy or the old widow uh, complations and things like that. But still, it's a very interesting story. So Heart's Joy is a real person. She's the best friend and lady in waiting of the Princess Karmestina. 
so what's happening here? The first example is Hartjoy has smuggled this tyrant, the French knight, into Karmazina's bed. He's busy fondling her breasts. But Hart Joyce is doing the talking and tricks the princess into thinking that it's she that caresses her. Because, you know, she's tired, she's had a bath, she's probably a little bit drunk, otherwise I would notice if there were an extra person in the bed, but you never know. So she's lying there naked, her best friend is fondling her breasts, and you know, as you do. And uh, the princess says, Oh, oh, oh. And Hodge will say, hey, don't make a fuss. You have just come out of the bath and your body is so soft and smooth. It is a joy to caress it. And the princess answers, well, touch me where you wish, says the pr princess, but not so far down. Uh, just sleep and let me touch this body that is mine, says Hodge Joy. Uh, because I am here in place of Tyrant, and there we insert the man to actually make this a little bit more acceptable to the heterosexual norm. She's there instead of him. And then she says, Tyrant, you traitor, where are you now? I think you would like to put your hands where mine are now. And of course it is Tyrant's hand and not Hartjoy's hands. But it's still, it's sort of normal for the princess, except not so far down there. Um, by this time, according to the story, Tyrant's hand is now on the princess's belly, while Hartjoy held her hand on Tyrant's head. When, note, when she noticed that the princess waked up from her, her slumber, uh, she grabbed Tyrant's hair to make him keep still, so she should not wake up properly. And with these joys, they were occupied for an hour, and all the time Tyrant was caressing the princess. So. This is really actually not a nice story, but it's funny in, in its way. So when Hearth Joy noticed that the princess actually has fallen asleep, she lets go of Tyrone's head to encourage him to attain the goal of his desire. But the princess woke a little and mumbles half asleep. What foolishness is this? Can't you let me sleep? Are you mad? Are you trying to do that which is against nature? So that's just actually referring to Hearth Joy and her having penetrative sex. And this goes on, but she soon noticed that it was more than a woman. And then you know what she was noticing. And then of course she starts crying, screaming out and uh, Tyrant has to run, uh, run away and falls off a roof and breaks his leg. Serves him good, I would say. Another example from this story is, again, Heart's Joy. She's sort of the person who makes things happen in this story. So they are, the, the ladies are hanging around in the garden and they are bored, really, really bored. Only as bored as you can be when all your events have been canceled. Uh, so they ask, what are we going to do? And Hartjoy is, this says, hey, I know something fun. So she go and gets herself a mask that makes her dark skinned. She's disguised as the Moorish gardener. And she starts making out with a pr princess. This is supposed to be a joke. An amusement for the group of women, a woman dressing up as a man, making out with a princess. Yes, seems normal. Uh, apparently, pre pretty advanced petting could, at least in literature, be seen as a possible amusement for unmarried women. Maybe this was a safety wall for the sexuality they could not express with men. Maybe somebody was just really, really weird when they wrote the book. Anyway, acts do not create identity. That the active woman in this case, Hearts Joy, really should prefer women as sex partners is out of the question. And actually, in the end of the book, she marries the emperor of Greece, which is Karmazina's father. But still, you see a lot of fondling going on here. So this is the secular world. That the nuns were strictly forbidden to do these things are partly because they were, in a way, married to Jesus. The same could actually be said for monks, at least according to Cistercian ideology. The monks saw themselves as Christ's brides. And that's why we also have some rather astonishing erotic visions and poetry from Cistercians, um, Cistercian convents. There are actually scholars who define nuns and monks as a sort of third gender in medieval society. Uh, because their social roles dif differed so much from the roles of lay men and women, and they had more in common with each other than they had with people, lay people of the same sex as themselves. 
So now we've done some, um, well, let's call it 15th century porn. This is in literature. What happens in real life? Well, repression is the headline I'm using here in my notes. But how much homosexuality was repressed varies from time to time and from place to place. I've already mentioned that in the ancient times and also actually in the early Middle Ages, there was probably not much repression going on. But we start seeing it from, on, from say, the plague and onwards, from the high Middle Ages and the plague years and onwards. And, uh, but we, you, and the amount of the repression and the amount of sources we have for repression also vary a lot from time, place to place. In Italy, in the late Middle Ages and in the Renaissance, which is one of the regions, regions we have the most and the best sources from, it appears actually that male homosexuality was tolerated by the authorities as long as it did not threaten marriage, inheritance and dynastic plans. I think you also can hear my neighbors drilling right now. Okay, good. Uh, so that's what it did. They, and then you can see a connection actually to the Roman idea. The important thing is inheritance, the family, all those things. What you do in between is not that important as long as you have this control and belong, do what your duty to society. But that said, there were regular raids in the late Middle Ages and in the Renaissance in Italy against homosexual men. And this sort of was a pattern. You have the raids and then you have a more lenient period when people are more allowed to do what they want to. And then you have the raids again. And um, it's sort of, you can see this actually in many regions, the state or the authorities. Um, you, you put these examples to show your displeasure, which of course for the individual can be disastrous. But for the group wasn't necessarily something that wiped out them. It was more... There you have, the, you state an example, and then you have a more lenient period, and then you state an example again. Um, one reason for this was actually that they thought it was best not to pry into what they considered as morally corrupt. They were also afraid, actually, that if you drew attention to these practices, more people would engage in them. It was apparently, if you got to know that you could do it, it was so tempting that you couldn't do, stop doing it yourself. Uh, these raids were, of course, like all kinds of repression and persecution. They were more common in, in, area, in time periods with stress, such like when there were economic problems or famines or like now, an epidemic. That is when you start repressing and persecuting those who are different. We, of course, all known about the persecution of Jews in connection with the, with the Black Death, and you actually see the same things with persecution of mainly gay men when there were plague or other kinds of troubles, because then you need to show that you're doing your best to make God happy by, you know, wiping out the morally corrupt, but also show, actually, you, you like to point fingers at people, you need the scapegoats. Uh, so you can actually never see these perceptions of the sodomite or of the fricatrice, they are always related to things that happen in society. And another example of this is, of course, the accusations that where same sex, well, where homosexuality was used as a way of accusing someone you didn't like. I've already mentioned that some of my colleagues have been researching accusation of being a sodomite towards kings in the Middle Ages as a sort of important political tool. But you also have, of course, accusations against the Templars. They were accused of um, doing horrible things to the host and to the Virgin Mary, but also accused of sodomy. And you also, of course, have the very well-known Albigensian Crusades, where one of the things that Albigensians were accused of was doing these unnatural things sins against nature, men lying with men, women lying with women. And there, of course, the church spent, had a very great role in this because they were the people who were taking care of our souls and taking care of morals. And as you can see, this is not the most well-structured lecture in the world of lectures. I'm going jumping back and forth and I'm going back to the church again. Because the church was, just as the Catholic church today, was in a dilemma. 
you had large single sex institutions and classes of people who were not allowed to marry, which was the only acceptable expression of sexuality. And actually, they were not that fond of that either. Celibacy was by far the best, but since most couldn't handle it, marriage was the acceptable compromise. That is also something that changes over history. Say around the year 1000, there were a very strong emphasis on celibacy as being the best solution. But the further you got into the Middle Ages, and especially in the late Middle Ages, you begin seeing marriage being uplifted and love between man and woman being more exalted than other periods. But still, they were not really that fond of that most of the time. They still thought it was a better thing if everybody was celibate. But it doesn't work like that. Um, one reason, of course, that they had this idea that celibacy was so, in celibacy was so important around the year also was that people actually believed that the world is going to end. But, so, they didn't like sex. They didn't like sex at all. But, of course, it was worse with sex that was non-productive, where you didn't get kids out of this. And they had problems with large single-sex communities. And they tried to hinder both love affairs and what we today would see as sexual abuse, because, of course, that's the hierarchy problem in this. If you look at theology, homosexual acts were defined as sin against nature. And that is why I have the title of this class. But it was not, this was not the only sin against nature. According to the very influential theologian Thomas Aquinas, sins against nature could be of four different kinds. And these were sorted under the category of lust. I really like that you have this sort of lists of sins you can do, the, the lust sins, the gluttony sins, the raw sins. Here we go with the lust sins, they're more fun. Uh, so, these sins against nature. Number one, masturbation. That is a very bad sin. Then you have bestiality, sex with animals. Then you have number three, which is sex between a man and a woman in an unnatural position, such as the woman on top or from behind. The first of these threatened the hierarchy between the sexes, and the second blurred the distinctions between humans and animals. So both these were unnatural. And sex with someone of the same sex is the fourth category of sins against nature. So you really see that homosexuality wasn't really pointed out as the big, big, horrible thing because there were so many other types of sins against nature. Other theologians, logians and other categories, and sometimes they made a distinction between sexual sins and sins against nature. Sins against nature was then when a heterosexual couple had sex in, and I'm quoting, in another place than where children were made. So that is also sin against nature. But generally, Thomas Aquinas, he was a very dominant theologian, the theologist, theologian, whatever. Um, they were dominant, but you can also, but, and there you see that homosexual acts were often sorted under a, a general category of non-reproductive sex, which also find masturbation and oral and anal sex. So again, it's not, this identity thing doesn't really work for, for the medieval way of thinking because they were interested in what you did. And then it is just as bad if I have anal sex as if two guys have anal sex, because in none of these cases, there could be a baby out of it, which is the only reason for having sex, as we all know. Which means that I, who have three children, have done it twice, because I have twins. So, this is what they thought about the role of homosexuality as a sin. But they also, of course, thought about why. Why did people have these relationships? Or why did people do these things? Obviously, homosexual acts were not according to God's plan, because God's plan would, was that we should be fruitful and multiply. Um, <coughs> but of course, medieval thinkers also wondered, why did people do this? And there were several explanations. Uh, of these, the religious explanations were the dominating, absolutely. And according to these, the agent behind all of this was, of course, the devil. Either the persons involved were the devil, 
were evil and depraved, which was of course a work of the devil, or they were tempted and lured by the devil directly. So that's why you do these things. But there are some examples of medical explanations too. Peter of Abano, who is a really important medical thinker of the 13th century, he was of the opinion that for some men, the center of sexual feelings and ejaculation had been displaced to the anus instead of the penis. So in that case, actually, it was not something somebody shows, it's just that, you know, they were different. Uh, the famous uh, scientist Abu Alcina, Avicenna, from the 11th century, he also mentioned this, but says that the cause is psychological rather than physical. But he also goes on with, it would be foolish to try to cure it because it's not possible. Avicenna was from the Muslim lands and this hierarchical type of sodomy was also found in the Islamic world in this time. Uh, but men there were supposed to have sex with both boys and women to choose only men were seen as perverse in medieval Islamic world. So there were some scientists who believed there was a physical, biological reason for men's homosexual acts. They didn't really deal with women's homosexual acts because, you know, women. Uh, but this didn't, of course, lead to acceptance. If you followed your natural inclination, you were still a sinner, you were still condemned, or at least have to do penance for it. And of course, this view can be found also in quite a few Christian groups today too, that God hates the sin, but loves the sinner. And that homosexual people are therefore not allowed to fall in love or have relationships unless they become condemned to hell. So this is a very old view that is still living. I come back to this constantly, but it is worth noting that this a similar line of thought was found in regards to heterosex also in the Middle Ages. It was important to control one's desires and sex really, really should be for babies, not for pleasure. And this means that the distinction between heterosex and homosex wasn't as sharp as it was later. Um, though sodomy was still a worse thing than, for example, to have sex with a menstruating woman, which of course was a sin, but still, there is a distinction that is different than it is today. My next headline on this paper, because I'm reading from a paper because I'm not used to lecturing, lecturing in English, is You Could Catch It. And I thought I'd share it because I think it's a nice title. Uh, because irrespectively of the causes that people saw, me, if it was the devil who tempted people, or if people were evil, or if it was physical, there was still a fear that male homosexuality could be contagious. This fear also had racist components, since both Muslims and Jews came to be linked to sodomy in medieval thinking. One motivation given for the Crusades was, for example, that the bishop should have been raped to death when the infidels took Jerusalem. And there you see you connect the infidels with rape, with homosexuality. And you find in a lot of 12th and 13th century sources, you find writings that people are afraid that the Crusaders could catch what they term the Oriental sin by being there. One of my favorite uh, authors on this, um, his name is Bosworth. He wrote this, very in, wrote this in a very funny way, I think, and it's very interesting that apparently, according to the straight churchmen in Europe, homosexual acts were so tempting that you just had to see it or be in a country where it was common and you just couldn't resist it. And that is something that you find interesting in a lot of historical sources about mainly male homosexuality is that apparently it is extremely tempting for the heterosexual male because as, soon, as soon as he gets in contact with it, he has a very hard time to you know, keep his control here. Well, to sum it up, one can say that the same sexuality, the way same-sex sexuality was viewed in the Middle Ages was different from ours in many ways. They were more condemning, but the degrees of condemnation was divided in ways that men may seem a little odd to us. Uh, the reason behind these were two. On one hand, the re religious doctrine that the only allowed purpose of sex was to make children, 
which means that even heterosexual sex in vessels not intended to beget children became a sin against nature. Another factor that is different was the strong hierarchical component in all forms of sex. Men were superior to women, older superior to younger, the nobility superior to commoners, etc. And as long as a man had an active and superior position, the condemnation from society was not so strong, especially not in the early Middle Ages, as if he took the passive role. A man penetrates, he does not get penetrated. For women, it was instead more important whether they had usurped the position of the man by using a dildo. And the woman who was perceived as the active partner generally got harsher punishments. So hierarchy is important. You can also see that the sexual roles and positions could be said to reflect the correct order of society, which is why some positions in heterosex were also forbidden, even if you could get children that way, such as the woman on top, because then you sort of undermine the role of society. It was very hard for people in the Middle Ages and the early modern period to conceive a sexually active man who only had sex with, another, with other men. The gay man did not exist. And this, of course, goes for women too, though the sources are even fewer. Young men in servile positions were often, and this continues into much later times, required to be at their master's disposition sexually. And this was, of course, also the case for women. And it's a consequence of these hierarchical ideas and thoughts regarding sex. Homosexual acts were never accepted in the Middle Ages, and people were sentenced to death for loving someone on the wrong, of the wrong gender. But the level of repression varied, and for example, in the Italian Renaissance, so-called boy love was very common among nobility and the intellectuals. So, just to sum it up, people were weird. No, people were thinking differently about these things. And this means that while there was repression, the reasons behind it was different. So now I'm finished and I can take some questions.